Welcome to Tales from the Periodic Table. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman, and today we're going to talk about the element iodine. I have a really nice sample of it right here. Let me show it to you. Iodine is a non-metal. You can see it's kind of a violet black solid right there. So uh, let's get back to our slides right now. Here, you see the beautiful periodic table produced by Theodore Gray. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, Teo has written one of my favorite books called The Elements, which I encourage you to pick up if you want your own copy. Check out his fantastic website, periodictable.com. Iodine is the 53rd element in the periodic table. Its atomic number is 53 because that's how many protons are in its nucleus, and that is what distinguishes it as this unique element. The element was discovered by the French chemist Bernard Courtois in 1811. I apologize for the quality of the photo, but it's the only one I could find, and it would have been taken near the date of photography's invention. More on photography later. Anyway, Courtois was in the business of manufacturing saltpeter, or potassium nitrate, a component of gunpowder. To refine the potassium nitrate, he used sodium carbonate, which he got from the burning of seaweed. Once the sodium carbonate was extracted from seaweed, the remaining waste was destroyed with sulfuric acid. Courtois noticed that when he added too much sulfuric acid, a purple cloud was created, and that this cloud would crystallize on cold surfaces. He gave samples of these crystals to his friends, Charles Bernard de Sorme and Nicolas Clement, and on the 29th of November, 1813, de Sorme and Clement made Courtois' discovery public. Courtois also gave a sample to Joseph Louis Gay Lussac. It was Gay Lussac who named it two years later, in 1813, after the Greek. Eudes, meaning violet. Eudes became iodine. Gay Lussac also chose iodine's chemical symbol, I. By the way, there are 14 elements with single letter designations, most of which I've already covered in this series. After iodine, we only have two more single lettered elements in Tales from the Periodic Table tungsten and uranium. The chart we've been using to talk about the origin of the elements claims that virtually all iodine, 95% of it, comes from merging neutron stars. While I have no evidence to support my opinion, this seems to me to be highly unlikely given the rarity of that event and the common nature of iodine. A new paper, recently published, proposes that neutron stars had far less influence in the evolution of the elements in the universe. Here, you see each element square with a chart of its own, showing that element's growth over the age of the universe by various processes. Iodine is here. I understand this looks complicated, but let's look at iodine a little closer. The horizontal axis of this square represents time from the Big Bang to now. The vertical axis shows the proportion of iodine created by various processes. Most of the iodine present today is believed to be produced in supernovae, the yellow area. Note that iodine produced by dying low mass stars, the magenta area, doesn't get started until a bit later. This is because low-mass stars exhaust their nuclear fuel much more slowly and last a long time before they start dying. Supernovae are very massive stars that use up their fuel quickly and die relatively young. The historical source of iodine on Earth is seaweed, which is burned, and then the ash was leached of its iodine content. Seaweed concentrates the iodine to fairly high levels, about 950 parts per million. Seawater could also be used, but iodine is fairly diluted, only one-twentieth of a part per million. 
Iodine is more than 20,000 times more concentrated in seaweed than seawater. Seaweed is now used for less than 2% of the iodine production in the world. This is an iodine extraction plant in Oklahoma owned by Iochem, a major supplier in the U.S. Natural underground brine, extracted from two-mile-deep aquifers, is brought to the surface and the iodine is extracted. The remaining brine is re-injected back into the aquifer. There are about 30 to 150 parts per million of iodine in the brine, far less than seaweed with its 950 parts per million, but far easier to process. About 45% of the iodine currently consumed in the world comes from brines. Iodine also occurs in some minerals, like the laurite on the left, which is calcium iodate, and the dietzite on the right, which also contains some chromate. In both, it's the yellow crystals that are the iodine-containing minerals. These are mined for their iodine high in the Atacama Desert of Chile and accounts for almost 70% of the world's production of iodine. As you saw at the beginning, iodine is a very dark, violet-black, non-metal element at room temperature. We'll see in a bit that it melts at a low temperature and becomes a beautiful purple vapor. Whereas most of the elements in the periodic table are metallic, Iodine is considered a non-metal. In the periodic table, generally speaking, metals are to the left of the red line and non-metals are to the right. Iodine is squarely in the non-metals. Iodine is a member of the halogens. Halogens make up the column near the right side of the periodic table. They are generally very reactive because of their electron shell configuration. Iodine is the last non-radioactive halogen we'll see in our tales from the periodic table series. Iodine, like all its cousins in the halogen column, is very chemically reactive. This is because the outer shell contains seven out of a possible eight electrons. At the risk of anthropomorphizing a bit, iodine really wants to fill that outer shell with eight electrons and will do almost anything to grab an electron from another atom. If iodine can do this, it looks more like its neighbor, xenon, which we'll cover in the next Tales from the Periodic Table with its complete shell of eight electrons. The main suppliers of iodine are Chile, producing about two-thirds of the iodine in the world, followed by the U.S. with maybe 22%, then Japan and Azerbaijan. The U.S. figure is a bit uncertain because actual production figures are withheld for proprietary business reasons. Since 1960, production of iodine worldwide has increased over six times. Today, Production is about 30,000 metric tons per year. How common is iodine? Not too rare on Earth, however, much rarer in the universe. It's the 62nd most common element in the universe at one ten millionth of a percent. There is no iodine in the sun. It's the 52nd most common element in meteorites. It's the 62nd most common element in the Earth's crust, about 0.2 to 0.5 parts per million, compared with 50 parts per million for copper or 14 parts per million for lead. It's the 20th most common element in the oceans, however. And in humans, it's the 25th most common element. There's only five more elements in us after iodine. The current cost of iodine is about $25 per kilogram. Over the past hundred years or so, iodine was valued as low as $1.80 per kilogram in 1938 and reached a high of almost $48 per kilogram in 2013. That peak was short-lived and we're back down to a much more reasonable price today. 
If we compare the size of the iodine atom to that of hydrogen, we'd see something like this. The iodine atom is a bit more than twice the size of hydrogen. Those outer electrons are held tightly. By the way, a picometer is a trillionth of a meter. Atoms are very, very small. Here are the atom sizes sorted from largest, cesium on the left, to smallest, helium on the right. Iodine is a smallish atom. You can see that the elements smaller than iodine are, with a couple exceptions, either halogens or noble gases. Each element has many different forms. For each specific element, the number of protons in the nucleus is the same, 53 protons for iodine. But there can be different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. All these different forms are called isotopes, and they're chemically identical to each other, but with slightly different weights. The number you see next to the chemical symbol is the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. There are 37 isotopes of iodine, and of these, there is only one stable, non-radioactive isotope, iodine-127. Iodine is therefore a monoisotopic element. There are 23 of those. This stable isotope therefore makes up 100% of the iodine in the universe. By the way, the word isotope comes from the Greek isos, meaning same or equal, and topos, meaning place, since all those various forms of iodine occupy the same place in the periodic table. Of the radioactive isotopes of iodine, these are the longest lived, the ones with half-lives over one hour. More about half-lives in the next slide. The longest half-life here is for iodine-129, but even its relatively long 15.7 million year half-life is but a blink of the eye in comparison to the 13.8 billion year age of the universe. Any iodine-129 or other isotopes that have been around have already decayed away. What's a half-life? Well, this graph shows an exponential decreasing curve. As an example, let's say we start with 1,024 atoms of any isotope from the previous slide. You'll see why I chose 1,024 atoms. I'll give you a hint, it's a power of 2, and we'll be doing a lot of dividing by 2. If you wait one half-life, half of your isotope will decay, and you'll have 512 atoms left. If you wait one more half-life, half of that half decays, leaving you with one quarter of the original 1,024, or 256 atoms. Another half-life, half as many again, or 128 atoms, and so on. Just keep dividing by two every half-life. After ten half-lives, you'll have about a thousandth of your original amount. By the way, notice there's one remaining atom after ten half-lives here. If you waited one more half-life, your remaining atom would have a 50-50 chance of decaying in that time. Iodine is moderately light, at 4.94 grams per cubic centimeter. As a reminder, water has a density of 1 gram per cubic centimeter, and I've put up a couple more densities for comparison. Here's a graph of the elements from highest density to lowest density. When we do this talk at the Exploratorium, we have a set of blocks so you can feel density for yourself, but we'll have to wait to do this until we're back in the museum. Our set of blocks have a wide range of densities, with the densest at tungsten, to lead, to copper, to iron, to titanium, to aluminum, and finally magnesium. We also have blocks that are made out of wood and plastic, but those are not technically elements. Again, iodine's density, the magenta circle, is about 4.9 grams per cubic centimeter and is the 63rd densest element, just above the density of titanium at 4.5 grams per cubic centimeter. 
Iodine has the 83rd highest melting point, a low 114 degrees Celsius, or 237 degrees Fahrenheit, just above the boiling point of water. There are only nine other solid elements with lower melting points. Iodine has the 83rd highest boiling point at 184 degrees Celsius. That's only 70.6 degrees above its melting point of 114. A very small difference between melting and boiling. Many people are under the impression that iodine does not melt to a liquid before vaporizing, called sublimation. But this is not true, as you can see in the movie. A heat source below the white dish has melted the iodine to a liquid, which is then vaporizing into a beautiful purple gas. Very few gases have rich colors like this. Iodine is a terrible conductor of electricity, almost at the bottom of this chart, meaning it's really an excellent insulator. Unfortunately, because of its high chemical activity, it can't be used for this purpose. It's also a good insulator for heat. Conductivity of heat usually follows conductivity of electricity because they both have to do with how hard it is to move around the outer electrons. From our periodic table of the spectra, we see that iodine displays a complex variety of emission lines all the way across the spectrum. Its spectrum is complex enough that it finds some interesting uses in astronomy. Let's take a look at some of the major uses for iodine. Every time I start to examine an element, I have no idea what I'll find. I'm often concerned that I won't find anything interesting about an element, or that there won't be any interesting uses for the element. I knew that iodine wouldn't disappoint me. Iodine and its spectrum plays a crucial role in the discovery of exoplanets, or planets outside our solar system. As an exoplanet, here in blue, revolves around its parent star, the yellow sphere, it's kept in orbit by the star's gravitational pull on the planet. But the planet also pulls on the star. This is Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. This means that planet and star are both in orbit around a common point called the barycenter. I've marked the barycenter with a white plus mark. This view is from directly above the system. If we were to view it from the side, say from far off in this direction, we would see the star approach us and then recede from us. As the star orbits the barycenter, it's giving off light waves, as you can see. But because it's moving, the light waves get compressed and stretched, sometimes closer together and sometimes farther apart. The compressed waves have a shorter wavelength and appear bluer. The stretched waves have a longer wavelength and appear redder. This is called the Doppler effect. So the Earth would be hundreds of light years distant, off in this direction. As the star moves away from us, the light waves are stretched and reddened. As the star moves towards us, the light waves are compressed and made slightly bluer. Again, this is because of the Doppler effect. So let's back away from the star system and travel the hundreds of light years to Earth. We can no longer see the motion of the star, but we can see its light. When we break this light into its spectrum, like you see on the right, you see a rainbow crossed by dark lines. These lines are from the elements in the star's atmosphere absorbing their unique colors. We can detect the motion of the star by looking at these lines in the spectrum. Remember, because of the Doppler effect, as the star moves away from us, the lines are shifted towards the red. As the star moves towards us, the lines are shifted towards the blue. The shift you see here is grossly exaggerated. In actuality, the shift is exceedingly small. 
The shift is so small that it would be hard to measure if you didn't have something to compare it with. This is where iodine comes in. Here's Paul Butler, an exoplanet astronomer, looking through a glass cell containing iodine vapor. The starlight passes through this cell, and the iodine vapor absorbs its own unique set of colors. This iodine adds its own set of lines to the star's spectrum, but since the iodine is sitting at rest on the Earth, there's no Doppler shift of the lines, and thus they are unmoving dark lines on the spectrum, and that gives the astronomer a fixed reference to measure the slight color shift of the star's light. Hence, the speed of the slight wobble caused by the invisible planet. It's this stellar wobble that gives away the presence of the companion planet, and impossible to see without iodine. These are the primary uses for iodine. Over half is used in the medical profession as an X-ray contrast enhancing agent and in pharmaceuticals. We'll be looking at these uses. So what is a contrast agent? Certain chemicals can block or partially block X-rays. Depending on the specific chemical, it will end up in a unique part of the body. Here you see two different iodine-based contrast agents. The contrast agent on the left is given to the patient through an IV and enhances blood vessels. The contrast agent on the right is swallowed orally, it's lemony, and enhances the contrast of intestines in the x-ray. Here are CAT scans of a tumor in a dog. The top row are standard x-rays and the bottom row are 3D renderings of the tissue. Note the increased contrast in the x-ray and the additional blood vessels visible in the CAT scan 15 minutes after the contrast agent is used. Iodine dissolved in alcohol is called tincture of iodine and is widely used as a disinfectant for cuts and scrapes. This stuff stings, but the sting comes from the alcohol, not from the iodine. You can still get this at any drugstore. Povidine iodine solution is also an antiseptic. You may have seen doctors swabbing the skin area where they're about to make an incision to be certain the area is sterile. An interesting note, faculty from University of Connecticut Health have proven that a simple method of rinsing with a diluted version of over-the-counter povidine iodine oral rinse can kill viruses like the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus and prevent transmission. This photo is what you can buy over the counter, a 10% solution, which is normally used on wounds. For an oral rinse, it gets diluted down to half percent solution. I have no idea what it tastes like, nor am I recommending you try this. Always consult with your doctor first. Iodine in your body tends to collect in your thyroid gland, which is in your neck. In the case of a nuclear accident, Often the isotope iodine-131 with a half-life of eight hours could be released. To prevent this environmental isotope from taking up residence in your thyroid gland, you can take a dose of potassium iodide. If the potassium iodide gets to your thyroid first, it will prevent any other iodine from being absorbed there, especially the radioactive variety from the accident. Of course, Evacuation, meaning removing you from the source of the isotope, also reduces the exposure. A goiter is an enlargement of your thyroid gland. This is a severe case. That's the gland at the front of your neck, just below your Adam's apple. Endemic goiters, sometimes called colloid goiters, are caused by a lack of iodine in your diet. Your thyroid uses iodine to make its hormones. Few people get this kind of goiter in countries where iodine is added to table salt, like the United States. Here, you see that it doesn't take much iodine to protect you, only 67 micrograms in a quarter teaspoon of salt. Before iodine was widely added to salt, this historical method of getting your dose of iodine was available in your chewing gum. I have no idea what it tasted like. 
Photography represents one of the oldest industrial uses of iodine. All non-digital photography that still uses film is based on light-sensitive properties of silver iodide crystals. Louis Daguerre was the first person to recognize this. He exposed a thin, silver-plated copper sheet to the vapor given off by iodine crystals, producing a coating of light-sensitive silver iodide on the surface. Today, the silver iodide particles are mixed with gelatin and coated onto one side of a plastic sheet, making our familiar film. Speaking of silver iodide, another use of this chemical is in the seeding of clouds. Here, rising hot air that contains nanoparticles of silver iodide are injected high into the atmosphere. These nanoparticles form the nucleus of an ice crystal, which grows and then falls as snow. It's believed that this can increase the snowpack to provide water later in the growing season when it's needed. Silver iodide flares are also flown into potential clouds on the wings of airplanes to promote snowfall. Polarizing film is manufactured by stretching polyvinyl alcohol, or PVA, plastic sheeting during manufacture. Iodine added to the PVA only allows through light vibrating in one direction. If you take two polarizing films and place them at right angles to each other, like you see in the video on the left, all light is blocked. Some sunglasses have polarizing film. These glasses can block glare from reflecting horizontal surfaces, like the water in the photo, and also darken the blue sky, a great reason to have a polarizing filter in your camera kit. Liquid crystal displays, or LCDs, also contain two polarizers, one behind the display and one in front of the display. Without these polarizers, the liquid crystals would not be able to turn the pixels on and off. So every time you look at your digital watch, your computer screen, or your television, you're looking through two layers of iodine. This is a scintillation counter used to detect and measure the presence and energy of X-rays and gamma rays. Under that cap at the top is a crystal of sodium iodide. The interesting thing about this crystal is that when it's hit by a gamma ray or an X-ray, it gives off a tiny flash of light, and the brightness of that flash is proportional to the energy of the X-ray or gamma ray. The flash is exceedingly dim, so dim that you must detect it with an ultra-sensitive device, like this photomultiplier tube. The sodium iodide crystal is mounted directly to the light-sensitive end of the photomultiplier. The photomultiplier delivers a series of electrical pulses that are then counted and have their strength measured. If you could listen to these pulses, they would sound like this. This visual representation has time running along the horizontal axis, and the height of each pulse gives you the energy of the gamma ray or x-ray that caused it. If we measure the energy of each pulse, and keep track of how many of each energy, we could build a histogram like the one you see here. Low energy on the left to high energy on the right of the horizontal axis, and the count of each specific energy detection on the vertical axis. The positions of the peaks you see are unique to the radioactive substance you're measuring, allowing you to identify the specific isotope, in this case, cesium-137. Gamma ray spectroscopy is an extremely useful tool, and iodine is an important part of this. Erythrocene, or red number three, is a red dye that was used in food coloring until recently. It's mostly been replaced by Allura red, or red dye number 40, but can still be used as a food colorant. Its molecule contains four iodine atoms. As we already mentioned, a small amount of iodine is essential for the body, which contains an average of 14 milligrams of the element. We'll end today's talk with Mary Soon Lee's elemental haiku about iodine. A fortunate fluke, 
found fuming from French seaweed, sublime purple gas. Thank you for watching Tales from the Periodic Table. The next program in this series will examine another interesting element, the noble gas, xenon. We hope you'll join us. This program, like all Exploratorium programs, is only possible because of donors like you. If you can, help us keep educational content like this free and accessible to all by donating today at www.exploratorium.edu give. Thank you.